computation expressions in F sharp. Probably one of the worst names you can find for a language feature is so fresh and so clean. When I use a different language, it feels like somebody took away my glasses, which is not such a big problem, but I get headache after a while. <laughs> Maybe the name is not too bad. And let's try to understand what computation and expressions could mean by inventing a programming language. Our language is based on expressions and a syntax for them. We have literals for strings and numbers, functions with exactly one argument. We can call these functions and we can reference variables available in the current context. Using that language, we can come pretty far when it comes to computation. Computation is transform input data into output data by an algorithm for a given expression. Since we know that what we have here is based on the lambda calculus, and if we leave some details aside, we can say anything that's computable can be computed with our language. And that also means we are done. That's it. That's all we need. There's no language involvement. Of course, there are other models of computations like the Turing machine, and we could come up with language for them as well, which could also be very simple. And again, we could say, we are done. We can stop here. That's all we need for a language. But that's not what happened actually. In reality, languages have evolved over time. There are many fields in which they evolved. Having a look at current languages, it's mainly about these three things. One. We have syntax, we just defined one above. Second, we have types. And we have missed that in our language, but most likely everyone would agree that types can help to ensure correctness. I want them. And we have tooling. So a key part of most modern language, it can help to write and maintain, understand and read code better or faster. But there's one question. What are the reasons for evolving languages? Even though we can already express everything. There are reasons like technical ones, for example, to control memory or performance, or we have to add some new syntax elements in order to have some working type inference. But the main reason and driver for evolving languages, from my point of view, is this one. Languages are made for us. To understand the meaning and impact of that sentence, there is a whole branch in philosophy where it's about the relation of language and thinking. Here's a quote by Ludwig Wittgenstein. The limits of my language are the limits of my world. I think this is not completely true, but within certain limits, it has great significance. For us as programmers, this could mean the way we think about a problem, the way we understand it, how we communicate about it and how we find solutions for it is closely related to the language we use. We cannot separate these things completely. The language is a significant part of our thinking. This is a driver for language evolution. So new language elements that helps us in thinking about the problem, understanding it, communicating about it, finding solutions for it, all is required even if you could already have formulated the same thing in a different way before, the syntax sugar helps us. We need it to be productive. Very often, for the mentioned fields, specific language elements are introduced. They are often hardwired in the compiler for that specific problem domain, making it sometimes impossible or very hard to use them for something else. But that doesn't have to be the case. So there are many ways that can help targeting abstractions over concrete problems. So just to name some examples is do notation in Haskell, for comprehensions in Scala, generators in Python, and computation expressions in F sharp. But unlike Haskell's do notation or similar, CEs, as computation expressions are often called, are not tied to a single abstraction. Instead, they work more like this. There's a set of well-known expressions available and the possibility to define some of their computational aspects within whatever context on your own. We will look at some real-world examples soon, I promise. But before, 
please let me give you some more properties and some more unique characteristics of computation expressions. So CEs support expressing monads, applicative functors, monoids and more in a way that feel really seamless when using them. They are supported by the type system and by the tooling. They are not macros. It's not possible to introduce completely alien constructs in the language. The language and its elements retain their original character. Things remain intuitive. And that means the language as a medium for communication is not turned upside down. It still works among people who already know the language. And communication still works. And this is very important. One of the big challenges in software development, communication, is hard enough already and it might be unpractical when allowing developers to obscure their language in whatever way they want. All right, as promised, examples. Let's begin with something simple, asynchronous programming. <laughs> it's not really simple, but the usage can be very simple. So we have a computation that gets three values from an asynchronous source and returns their sum. To actually see what's going on here, I have added some unnecessary type annotations. So what is it good for? We can see that there's a let binding. On its value expression, on the right side, the values type is async of int. The type of its identifier on the left side is only int. This is unusual and something different applies to let. The type of the value expression and the type of the identifier are the same but not here. So there must be something in between that does the trick. The async keyword defines a well-known set of functions that the compiler uses for the let bang, you know, this exclamation mark. And that let bang binding and the return statement, they are well-known and they match. In F sharp, this is done by having an instance of a class type available in scope that has the necessary methods defined, like so. And now don't worry if you do not understand completely what happens here, because in the tutorial part, we'll have a deeper look at it and you'll be able to do all that stuff on your own. So next example, we have Vite DSP. This is a library for digital signal processing. And it's possible to compose state-aware functions as if they were pure functions. And again, we see the let bang here, but this time it has different semantics. The abstraction is similar, it's a monad, but computation is different, which is defined by the DSP keyword that you see. Next candidate, Validus. This is an extensible validation library for F Sharp with built-in validators and the possibility to define your own validators. And we see let bang again, but there's also a new player and it's a new abstraction. This is indicated by and exclamation mark, which is called and bang. And this allows for building up context en bloc, an applicative functor, instead of step-by-step, -step, monad. And again, all this is possible when the validate keyword has somehow defined the necessary well-known functions. And these functions, they enable the things we can do inside the computation. This is an important aspect and you should remember it when doing the tutorials. The functions available define what we can do in the context of our computation. And the flexibility continues. List comprehensions. This seems like something completely new. And it also, it is. So, because there is no let bang or return or and bang, but instead we have yield and for. And just to let you know, this is not something that is built in the language per se. Only the abstractions and the way to define them is built in the language. And although we do not exactly know what my list defines and how it works, I already told before that the things that remain intuitive and from an intuition point of view, the result of this computation could be 0, 1, 2, 100, 101, and so on, until 105. And also, as a side note, the yield keyword can be omitted, so it is uh, implicit, and the syntax that you see here is also valid. Now, there are many interesting CEs available that combine all these different abstractions. 
One of them is Vite. Vite is a UI library with a React for Everything approach, targeting different technologies like Fable for the Web, Avalonia or MAUI. Vite makes use of the same abstractions that we saw in the DSP example. That fits very well with UIs, where we have to deal with state all the time. And how does it look like? So we can define quasi-mutable state using monads as abstraction and let bang. We can use implicit yields for UI elements that themselves are composed using local state monad, where their state is basically a reference to the corresponding UI element. And it goes much further. Loops can be used in conjunction with implicit yields to insert repeating elements in the UI. Conditionals can be used, pattern matching and more. From a user's perspective, in my opinion, this is a very intuitive way of defining UIs. And all this is possible because there is no hard focus on one single abstraction, but a seamless mix of all of them. And this makes the power of computation expressions, at least one of its powers. And there are examples of a lot more of things that can be done with them. So, and there's the thing that is called custom operations. Custom operations take the idea of flexibility in combination with remaining idiomatic to a whole new level. With them, it is possible to write record-like expressions with the ability to control precisely how they are evaluated and what is possible in which stage of the computation expression from a user's point of view. And yet they remain very readable. But you can do even more. So you can implement something like a query language, which is called query expressions. And this is part of the F sharp core library. So this is a SQL like thing that you can either run against collections in memory or you can translate it just by taking an AST and transpile it to whatever target data source you have. Now, for the upcoming exercises, our goal is this. We will extend the language by defining several computation expressions that can be used by other programmers. To do so, we have to understand one more thing. So we already know that all these things here is syntactic sugar. And there's a syntactic sugar, it's a syntax on the surface. But which deeper syntax are they transformed to and how? And we have to get a feeling for that in order to write good computation expressions. So what happens? The F sharp compiler rewrites or desugars the expressions inside of the curly braces. And how does he do that? So in the end, it is a mix of several things. So we have rules for the lookup, which methods are used for which language element. We have rules for how the selected methods are composed. And there's a certain amount of flexibility in that process and it is controllable by using overloads. For custom operations, we also have an amount of flexibility because we can specify their behavior through predefined patterns. So when you get hands-on, you have to know the actual implementation of these methods that are resolved by rules. Go into something called the builder type. We have already seen that. The builder type in F-sharp is just a class type defining that set of methods that have to follow some conventions in order to be usable. And there are also rules for typing, but they allow certain flexibility. For example, it's not required using polytypes or a specific number of type parameters. As long as an unambiguous overload resolution is possible that will lead to compilable desugared code, it's fine. We then have to have an instance of that class type and followed by curly braces, the magic happens. That's it. Really simple. Now, Dave has prepared a live demo for you that shows the desugaring process for arbitrary computation expressions. And after that, you will have the chance to try out all that in the exercises. For the exercises, I wish you a lot of fun. That's all from me. Thanks again. Dave, here you go.